Welcome aboard Tuesday night between the rolls. The Socium Project is uh, what's on tap tonight. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we really like this uh, episode, these episodes, uh, because at the end of the year, we're going to go ahead and give you all a treat. You guys are going to be able to play in Socium uh, because we are going to get everything squared away. Uh, tonight, we're going to be discussing timelines and major events for each of our respective nations. So uh, hang on to your ass. This could prove to be quite entertaining. Don't forget to follow us on Twitch. Follow us on Twitter. Take a look at our YouTube archive. If you want to shoot the shit with us about D&D, join our Discord. If you want to buy our cool crap, like phone case, this cool shirt from Murder Hobo Con, uh, throw pillow, shit like that, the link is down below. Uh, if you are in the market for some custom dice, go ahead and check out on Twitter at Pirate Dog Dice. Uh, see if they've got the time, the energy, or even the will to go ahead and make you some custom dice. And if your game stinks, unlike ours, ours just reeks of success, uh, try some Adventure Sense by Oddfish Games. They have over 60 cents to tickle your nasal uh, funny bone. Uh, except for putrid sewers, that's what you put in the boss's air vents in his car. Uh, they also have something called the Shine System, so if you want to be like me, and uh, you know, I don't want to say Stephen King, but I'll say Stephen King, only you want to write much better than us, uh, go ahead and check out their Shine System. That being said, welcome to Socium Project folks uh this week we got four of our dms including myself uh in two weeks we got the other four so let's go ahead and start by introductions uh we'll start on the top here on my screen and that is carol carol who are you uh yeah who are you tell something who about am yourself. I? uh well as he said as i like to say uh my name is carol uh, I'm a longtime gamer occasional gm and commission mini painter i have my own twitch under uh, muses underscore touch and I would do mini painting Saturdays at 1230. My God, it takes me a minute to think. Mondays at seven and Wednesdays, which would be tomorrow at 830 p.m. Eastern time, where I paint minis and chat or whatever. And uh, on here, uh, I, I'm involved in this lovely project. And I also am, I play Andre Yeager in the CRED campaign, my somewhat crazy half elven ranger very so. nice uh <laughs> spencer you're up next all right hi uh, i'm spencer um i'll keep sharing more information as we go along because i'm one of the oddballs out in this uh so i'm a teacher of seven years in high school in public high school so for those who don't know about it um i teach a language you may figure out what it is later um i'm also a dungeon master of many years i've been playing since i was 10 um, and just because this come up earlier in a conversation of ours, people were asking about how high of a level they'd gotten to. My current campaign that I'm running is level 12. Um, nice. we, completed, we completed a total level 20 campaign uh, a year ago. Um, oh, I can't look it up. Yeah, this is our uh, second, we're hitting our second COVIDversary of our online gaming. So we're hitting to our second campaign at level 12 right now. Nice. My players are dealing with uh, very small, very small aboliths and, uh, and krakens right now trying to get through that and you haven't been slimed uh multiple been slimed the best one was uh he lost his mind completely eaten by an intellect devourer so he's a dwarf fighter <laughs> and, no it was it was, a it was a tabaxi rogue oh you uh, can't say tabaxi carol shut <laughs> up i do not in fact, in fact right now speaking of level 12s i believe our skull and shackles pirate crew is level 12 right now Nice. Where my nice. pirate captain is in love with a tabaxi or a K a a K a cat boat because oh, they're cat they're kitties. <laughs> cat, cat, yeah, it's in, in Pathfinder. It's called cat folk, So yeah, he, he uses his psychic claws, and we regularly make fun of him for literally losing his mind. Nice. That's great. Does he still have his abilities? Not no. He was he was literally a husk. There was nothing there. <laughs> there was nothing there for nice. a while. He had to get it all back. Nice. Uh, last but certainly not least, Jason. Jason, tell us about yourself. 
Uh, so I am a regular on the Margu campaign playing Copious Bull Bitters the third, uh, and then have done a couple of times for DM of various things, Murder Hobo Con, the first one, and then once on the show, which we need to get back to, honestly, uh, and finish up that adventure with David and the crew uh, when he's back. But longtime player and happy to be part of this project with the Socium Project. That's been uh, that's been a good project. Long time DM off camera too, <laughs> and have yet to have a D and D character make it past level ten. So it's because your DM's a dick. <laughs> Although you guys are what eighth level now. Uh, I believe the one player is trying to convince you we're eighth level, but we're actually seventh level. That's right. Uh, Margu took a six month hiatus due to issues. So, uh, yeah. but they're back, and uh, you guys will be eighth level in no time, and then you die. So the DP didn't yeah. kill you. So uh, that's right. There are clones of Copious already in the in storage, so I'm not too worried about it. <laughs> Copious vault bitters. <laughs> uh, folks, as Carol <laughs> mentioned earlier, she is part of the Cred campaign. They go Great. live this Thursday. Uh, yeah. This Saturday, we've got Calamity B side. Uh, the boys from Toad Town are back at it, uh, stuck in the swamp. And then hopefully on Sunday, uh, assuming I don't lose power again, since I apparently live in Afghanistan, uh, we do Margu A side. Uh, recent. Uh, edition uh drow female which should do real well on the surface uh i don't think uh frank uh, thought that went through at all <laughs> so somebody's gonna have to find a magical item i suppose i guess I'll, I, I'll have to stop being stingy folks this is the socium project we have gone ahead and created a huge continental map uh we've divvied it up and we've each taken a couple of different um nations uh each of those nations have started to become fleshed out tonight we will discuss uh timelines and major events now uh, as somebody and I, I can't give them credit because i don't remember who uh maybe one of these guys mentioned that uh just because say my nation calls it one thing that doesn't mean that spencer's nation would call it by the same thing so that's that's something important for new dms to remember uh, it doesn't all have to be consistent. It's just like the language barrier barrier that you will experience. Sure, in D&D, you use common, but <laughs> maybe, maybe not. So let's go ahead and throw up the screen here uh, as to what we're dealing with. Uh, and I need to make sure that it is correct on the stream. It was not because I'm a dumbass. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with Carol. Uh, Carol, uh, which nation do you want to discuss? Will. Oh, heck. Uh, can you switch it around to Sea Haven? I mean, maybe it's on stream normal, but I've got... Yep, this is it's, not it, my land. It, it's good on stream. Okay, great. Uh, but this, okay. Is, this is an older map, so it doesn't have it. We are dealing <clears> with this portion right here, folks. Okay, so I'll start with the founding of sea haven because it's actually a very fairly new country in its current state <clears throat> because somebody kept insisting there are nazi dwarves in the area some jackass maybe yeah some total jerk ah there we go oh yeah you didn't that's this is before the place name. So that's right i have it if i need it i have it handy uh basically sea haven was founded only about 30 years ago <laughs> Um, by one certain Captain Rosa Blackthorn. Before that, it was a kingdom known as Kernis Kral. It was a home to a group of xenophobic dwarves who would mostly enslave anything that wasn't dwarvish or kill all the rest. Um, <clears throat> and they would even do raids across the border to my other kingdom, Traskillian, to get elves to take elves as slaves. Um, <clears throat> about 10 years before, just to give a little motivation of Rose's motivation, other fact, one thing, she hates slave nation, she hates slavery, she was impressed as a sailor, which basically was slavery. So she hates slavery of all types. And she, I haven't figured out exactly where she originally, but somewhere around here, um, obviously one of the other nations, she wasn't from there. 
And uh, so, but they also took her, they also murdered basically or executed her pirate grandfather, Erasmus Blackthorn. So she decided to, she wanted to make the water safer for pirates and hated them with a passion and knew because she's in theater, said so she's probably somewhere. What is that nation? What's the nation right across? I mean, if the nation of Tar. That would be uh, Aquinas. Aquinas. Is that, are there humans there? Uh, they're Romans, essentially. Okay, perfect. Nope, that's, that's perfect. And they're under siege. Well, they are now, but this was 30 years ago. So, um, so she lived, yeah, she lived right. She probably lived in Port, the Puerto Morata, which is like barely on the edge of my screen right here. So, um, so to make things safer for pirates, like they really should have things safer, but whatever. And uh, said more or less because her whole motivation is she hates them. And she, of course, being from the area, she knew that they were running around taking the elves. So she managed to strike a, a chord with the very reclusive elves, as I mentioned, because they tend to stick to themselves. But they were sick of this too. And she built a fleet of other pirate caps and such, and they basically went in and took out all the Nazi dwarves. Ha! The ones in the Sky Blaze Mountains are a different, they were a different clan. They kind, of, they kind of stuck to themselves too. They, they had nothing really to do with the ones that they're originally socialist Nazis. <laughs> no, they're not Nazi. No, the ones in the, the the ones in the thing are not Nazis. They're they're perfectly good, and they have a trading relationship. So she basically took over about thirty years ago, and she still runs the place. She's older, and she has kids and such, but established the pirate council, and and I think that's. I don't know. Is there any questions or I think that's about it in terms of that. The, the founding would be, of course, a major, major uh, item on the timeline. Hey, Carol, uh, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Just uh, in terms of your, your 30 years ago, um, if you can you place that in the context of zero year? Uh, I don't know what I don't know what zero year is. He hasn't told us what year it currently is. So it's, it's whatever. Uh, 1022. So then subtract 30 years from 1022. What is okay. that? So that's 982. 982, yeah. 992? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't have 92. the... the 999, nine, wait. 992. Is, it's 992, was, yeah. Yeah, 1022. So current year. That would be helpful, actually. Also, I like round numbers, so there's a lot of 30s and 5,000s and things like that. Current year. Is ten, do you have a do you have a before do you have before uh pcy zero? pcy common year cy is common year zero and then pcy okay is pre. so we can have you can have whatever you want that go thousand okay cool because i just, might live for a thousand years and i want to kind of keep it going with that so you know, otherwise there wouldn't be, it wouldn't really work with the story of the other kingdom. And I'll get to that when we get back around, but, cause I assume you wanted two things for, oh wait, you wanted two things from each place? Nope, just one. Just one? Okay, so that's that's my first one. Jason, uh, did you have a follow up on that one? Yeah, yeah. I, I did. So so if all of this took place uh, 30 years before, the uh, what, what was in existence before that 30 year uh, to, uh, a dwarven the kingdom? No, no, a dwarven, the dwarven, the Nazi dwarven kingdom. <laughs> the, the Nazi dwarf. So they, the Nazi I, dwarves. I they, were, they weren't Nazis. They were national socialists. <laughs> no, 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 no. These were Nazis. They were Zeno okay. These Nazis. are officially Nazis. Okay. Yes, the the ones he's talking about are the ones that currently still live, but they're not Nazis. They're not nationalistic. <laughs> they just. They like to, they like, no, they're not, no, no, they're not, because basically the ones that are currently in the Apexian Mountains, um, uh, they're city names, but I, they're woke. Dwarves. Earth home, Earth home. <laughs> Basic, shut up. So my land, my rules, so shut the fuck up, right? Uh, so, no, they, they basically, they're basically, uh, they're kind of your stereotypical dwarves who work, you know, the some of the greatest weaponsmiths in in the world 
and they have a trade agreement with the rest of uh i sort of broke up my country into two that's fine so they so have sea haven and one and basically have the dwarven and the cities they're not really a country the per se free the cities just, man free yeah, cities yeah, basically that's what they are and and rosa loves you yeah, rosa's all for it free anything you know so free love absolutely there oh rosa absolutely freaking lootly free love that's true spencer you got any questions for uh the not nazi socialist but fuck you <laughs> So, um, the cities, because we talked, I remember talking before about the cities that the, uh, the towns that pirates had created. Um, so those are still, if they're only 30 years old, they're just a really rough and tumble places. No, 30, um, years, 30 years, you can build, you can build a lot in 30 years. So this no, is true. I would say, no, I would say they're pretty, they're pretty civil. I mean, it, it's a rolling pirate town. So there's lots of taverns and I mean, there's not anything, there's not like, you're not going to have a cathedral that's like takes yeah. 100 years to build. There's nothing yeah. like that. But wooden, you know, sturdy wooden buildings that were made to, 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 to you know, deal with the weather and such. Because I assume there's storms and, although it's, you know what, actually, it's probably a pretty protective cove, come to think of it. Because mm -hmm. you do, so it's, it's you yeah, you've got this, you get this whole bay that's really small so in reality maybe a lot of big storms don't come in there you might get big storms that'll generate some waves but you probably snow it's yeah probably you'll get, get snow. snow yeah you'll get snow up here but like you know like i'm in mass and we get nor'easters and basically you know if you're out in the cape uh, cape cod or you know even up around where i am i mean we can get direct hits right from the ocean Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. I remember because I lived uh, now I <clears throat> I went to college in Salem, Mass, aka the Witch City. But that yeah. is also in a bay. It's 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 back. It's not exposed to the ocean. We've got Marblehead, and uh, I believe Marblehead kind of protects it. And it wouldn't nearly be as bad there. I mean, we get waves and we get wind, but it wasn't quite as bad as it was out if you go out in Marblehead Neck. Cool. Well, my, my my question is if it's so if it's so recent, right? Because the city might be a kind of new. It's not going to be not going to be the cathedral. It's not going to like a massive stone wall yeah, yeah, yeah. necessarily around it. But also, um, might there still questions. be some of like pockets of those kind of the actual evil dwarves? It's possible because that I, could be an interesting part of like they want revenge, right? Because they're going to be long lived and. They're going to hold a grudge, right? I mean, it is possible. Actually, if nothing else, if they're not there, if they're not there, then they could where are be, they? They, they could be refugees. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. no idea where they would go. I don't know what would accept them, but they'd be very underground. They would, it's going to say, that I, would, I mean, I suppose they could have adopted a few up in the mountains there, but there could be an enclave in the mountains somewhere. Cool. See, but secret, it's secret. Nice. Secret. Good ad. Yeah. Good ad, Spencer. Spencer, you're up next. Uh, which yeah. region are we looking at? Uh, let's do the Golden Sea, the region of the Golden Sea. Gotcha. Uh, just south of that, um, the shared uh, Lake Unity, I believe is what people are calling it. Well, it seems to be stuck, so I'm going to stop the share, go ahead and start talking, and I'll get the share cool. up there. Uh, so the main thing I'm talking about is so if common year was 1,022 years ago, um, during that time of troubles, during that great apocalypse that's coming and hit, um, so about 50, 20, 50 years afterwards, so around the year 50 to about 100, um, there are a bunch of refugees who are fleeing to different places. And the area that is the Golden Sea was desolate. Um, We'll talk later about the creation of the Wyvern Pass, but the lake may have been, already been there. But the area between where Paradise is and the entirety of the Golden Sea was nothing but arid land, either salt flats or rough and tumble land with very few resources. Not a lot going on. People were shunted into this area, kicked by those who were stronger, more powerful than them. And they just had to flee into the most inhospitable places where they couldn't survive. These people st 
starving, dying of dehydration, pleaded, begged, prayed for some sort of, of deliverance. And the blessing that was bestowed upon them that they saw, not from the sky that they were looking for, not the rains that they had prayed for, but instead were rolling across, which was these rolling reefs, these literal balls of water, tens, hundreds of feet wide, rolling along the wa- rolling along the dirt, bringing life to a place that otherwise didn't have it. And filled with fish, filled with sea life from the southern seas, these massive spheres of water were able to parch the throats of the refugees. And these aquatic wonders, which no one had seen before, brought blessings and life to these people and to the Golden Sea, which is why we call it the Golden Sea today. So this started 100 years ago after this, po- uh, after this apocalypse because this coral was trying to escape the water. They wanted to get out. The water was changing. Something was wrong. Something was different. And it turns out this coral that was living in this area was semi-psychic. They had small psychic fields and were able to band together to create a bubble of water that they could travel across the land and get more minerals that they deemed pure, they deemed safe. And so they... The coral traveled across the land, the people came across the coral, and thus created an entire society of nomadic peoples following along. And that created the Golden Sea. So because of that, the city that is there on Lake Union still stands as people hold, as people revere it as a place of meeting, as a place of safe haven, that everyone can travel there, anyone can stay there, they need to, in honor of their need centuries ago. Nice. Uh, Jason, questions? Yeah, I just want to... So, I love I love the visual of giant yes. ball of water with coral rolling across. So, did that form Lake Union and that pass, or Ooh. is the... Good question. Or, and then that, is the that, coral still, still living somewhere in the Golden Sea? That's a great question. So, my, my concept is that the, the coral is still rolling across periodically from place to place. Um, we'll talk about the Wyvern Pass. Uh, I've got a plan for how the Wyvern Pass came to be. That whole pass is only about 300 years old. So, that, that whole body of water, that, that one section is new. The lake is probably old. Maybe this is how the water came to the lake. That could be it. The water literally migrated to the lake. Um, that could be part of it. That could be really cool. Um, yeah, but I've got a better, I've got a different concept for the, for the, for the pass. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Is the coral magical? It's semi-psychic. So yeah, it's magical. It's, 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 it's like, like it it's, cause every single piece of coral is, it's actually, you know, a living organism. They can't, you know, control their power on their own. They can just like control their little field. They're, they're, they're like, they're like, uh, they're like an ant colony, right? They're like, there's, they're, they're a colony of coral. So they, they kind of work together and like, we need to go somewhere else. Water, not fresh. <laughs> I'm picturing Aquaman. Exactly. Uh, Water isn't fresh. Carol, questions? Uh, no, I was going to say, are they actually sentient? Is the coral actually like sentient? Believe <laughs> it or not, it could be sentient. They might be. But if someone the, could communicate with them, maybe. Maybe they have like an intelligence of and, seven. And here's the other thing. Is it magical enough that it would draw interested parties from wherever? You know, maybe it can be utilized. Oh, yeah. Magic? I'm sure. I'm sure it definitely can be utilized. I'm sure there's definitely there. And, and, and that's probably a source of contention that there's someone studying it and they want to start harvesting the coral to be used as some sort of magical power source or, or, or find a way that they can use it. And the people that who live there, they don't want that. They're, they're nomadic it, around it. Would it would it be enough? Would it be enough to have a one nation go to war over it? I mean, would I wouldn't be shocked. That much? I, I wouldn't it, be shocked. I think actually all this would be great ideas for for campaign type stuff too. Mm-hmm. Well, in I December think- we're doing adventures, so you know. Uh, I, I have one already for the Shar Curry, so, you know, I, I'm in agreement. I, 
I'm thinking Jeff's paradise country is going to enslave those things because <laughs> he's enslaving. There, there's everybody. a reason oh, the only shoot. the only defensive the only defensive fortifications are towers across that that southern boundary. <laughs> What's the human? What, is that humanist? Uh, no, humanity's further north. Yeah, humanity's in the northeast. That's uh, that's John's. Jeff has paradise and. And it's another something else. Wait, wait, and his is another one that wants to enslave people and. Par paradise is uh, hobgoblin slavers. Humany, not hobgoblin slavers. Not hobgoblins. Uh, okay. uh, paradise is the slavers. Humany are the religious zealots. The Catholic yeah. so, Church, essentially. Jeff, just just to put a point out there, in case he hears this, uh, Ro Rose has definitely declared that uh, those types of ships from those nations or any other such nations that believe in slavery at all, there it's open season on them for the pirates. Come to the east, <laughs> Jason. <laughs> you're up next. What you got? I just. I like all these. All, Carol's got these ships with letters of mark out there running down pirates, <laughs> running, oh, pirates yeah. running down slave ships. Uh, That's right. So, well, no, there, there. There's no letters of mark. They're just pirates. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just like we're, we're transitioning from an RPG to basically a tabletop war game. Real soon. It kind of is. Yeah. I was thinking that the last time too. Well, and I think one of the problems with this, this is a great concept. Socium is a great concept. The only problem is every single one of us, all eight of us, are so freaking invested <laughs> that it's like, well, let me go ahead and explain the third dynasty to you. <laughs> go ahead, I'm not Jason. Too it's uh, you. Which one are you going to talk well, about first? You know, with that segue, that I, the really the story of both these nations is intertwined. So I'll, I'll touch on the whole thing. So much like Carol said, that you end up when you've got two countries next to each other, they end up linked somehow. They have to be. Yep. And my story for the event, I'm just going to go ahead and take zero year. I picked a couple other, but I think zero year is probably the good one. So um, CY0, the great cataclysm that led to the formation of Ilya Stahl. So originally, and Spencer, you probably will appreciate this piece. So originally, the Udarat estuary, which you see on the screen, that that waterway did not exist on zero year. Uh, there was a, a city where you see the ruins of Starini Ashti. There was a city named Sazani was actually located there and was always ruled by twin siblings. Uh, peacefully uh, was as many of these golden age civilizations are, height of culture, height of learning, magic, etc. But unfortunately, two brothers. And yeah, as Frank said, you get so invested in this, you can't help but go way too deep. So I'm not going to give you the fact I've got their names written here. So when <laughs> Frank publishes all this, I'll give you the whole names and everything. But two brothers ended up fighting their followers split. The whole area fell into civil war. And right in the midst of all that, there was a strike from the heavens. Uh, a meteoroid came down. It was they thought it was uh, the judgment of Dura. And it was Dura spear was what it was called. So spear fall. The spear lanced through the area, splitting the land in two and ultimately destroying the city of Sazani uh, and leaving the ruins that you see on the screen. So that started the zero year, but the, the population that lived there, known as the L, fled the area in a diaspora that spread across the entire continent below where the city was to the south, Iliastal, led by Ilion who was uh, identified as the savior who led them away from the city and the ruins and helped form the empire of Ilya Stahl. Um, short order after about a couple hundred years of settling in that area, they looked to the west at the tribal um, tribes that inhabited the Kovat Arat. And of course, being an, a warlike um, group, the empire quickly subjugated Kovat Arat, uh, made it a subject kingdom to Iliastal. And so that's the short version of the story. I can go into much more detail, of course, but I won't, I won't drag out the pain too much. Uh, okay, we'll start with questions from Spencer. Very cool. I love it. Um, so this meteor, I've got some ideas for what it might be. 
But do you have a concept of what this meteor could be besides just a meteor? I, I've left it ambiguous at this point, so I'm very interested in hearing what your, your thoughts are. Good, good, good. <laughs> uh, you see, Ian and I have been discussing something, and, and I don't know if you know much about Ian and I, uh, but we are uh, uh, the fan of cosmic horror. Yep. That's <laughs> and, the color out of space. Take your pick. It's all good. That's a good uh, one. And uh, we we have come to an agreement that uh, this thing that has come as meteors uh, are perhaps ancient gods, elder things of some divine origin. Who knows uh, that have, that or what caused this apocalypse? And that that's kind of our plan that we have uh, down down in the gray wastes in his area and and in mine. Well- I, I, I saw some of that discussion <laughs> and I, I I didn't want to tap into it yet, but I want to, I, you know, I think if that's the direction we go for zero year, that yeah. lots of, you know, you get a couple of, of dinosaur killing meteorites hitting places. It can cause everything else to occur, earthquakes, tidal uh, waves, et cetera, disruptions to weather patterns. But I had come up with a meteoroid to be the what split these two uh, nations apart and then you guys start talking about them like that's perfect i love proto civilization elder god stuff and i'm like let's this go is great eldritch horror stuck in the ruins and one of the things i'll mention that the ruins of um there, there's very little trade that comes out at iliostal it's lowlands it floods during the the uh rainy season etc i've got all that uh, windmills everywhere but there's a a cash crop that can be harvested in the ruins is a magic infused blossom that's left over from either the meteoroid or from the ruins of the of the city so it would go very well with spreading that whole transformative elder horror kind of piece if people are constantly trying to get in there and get stuff love it love it nice. so I, I like use the, that use the sandy peterson cthulhu rules <laughs> to run any game in this system uh in this no uh actually so year zero so we're making we're making year zero when this meteorite lands I think on, on the zero west year, yeah yeah, yeah on the west year. yeah but I, I like the thought of it you know maybe that's it started like a chain reaction or something because i mean i've got a major disaster in the east but maybe somehow it's all tied together mm. I, I mean is that possible or is it too far west and i should just go with plan you'll know a. in about a minute and a half <laughs> <laughs> hey well i'm no, I'm thinking and i'm like tweaking as i'm doing it. um oh so do people find fragments of this meteor right now and then is this oh, oh i'm over? sure are they well you know it's sort of like the coral are they magical is there some sort of a huge value to them the fragments themselves, not necessarily the aliens they may have contained if they did. You know, I, I think if we were to go down and explore that, especially as we get later in the development of the world, having the meteor fragments be infused or be valuable by themselves as a metal, uh, you know, metal with special properties. Star or, metal. You know, star metal. <laughs> or, or star O metal. Oh, you know. but yeah, we had star O metal. <laughs> oh, God, no. No. Um, unobtainium unobtainium yes, no a that's one. that's a class of female Vibrani- vibranium <laughs> go let's go for all the the tropes here wow but i i do like that idea carol if you start thinking about special property that fragments highly very rare highly valued fill in the blank sounds yep. like something rosa would go hunting for too so Money! I, Pirates would go hunting for well, them. It leads, it leads down a whole train of campaign stuff, doesn't it? I mean, almost mm-hmm. every nation. Oh, yeah. It really mm-hmm. does. Mm-hmm. I, so I do have much- a question about about this empire. So this this the the original empire at its height existed for who knows how long, but it was destroyed a thousand years ago. How long did it take for Ilias Dahl to come about? And as a historian, did those people, did, did they like talk of it as like this sort of like dark age that they don't discuss where like they're they lost history do they still call themselves back to that original empire or do they consider themselves somebody entirely new so in the the broader cultural piece the the ruling so it's a 
I, I'm going to I'm going to break. Frank's going to kill me later. So part of what ends up happening is they Ilias Dahl is ruled by a lich king. Oh, you're so, holding out on us. One of well, the original, well. one of the original brothers survived the the uh, cataclysm, and actually resides in the Tower of Grief in Kovat uh. Rot, and has seventeen original founding families still are the rulers of Ilias Dahl to this day that were part of the original diaspora that fled the the destruction of the city. So they have their ties directly back to zero year. And that and that uh, piece, and they have religious observances that tie back to zero year, as a result oh, of that. I love that. That's awesome. That's such so, a cool concept. <laughs> that's where it ties together. the The Lich King is insane at this point after a thousand plus years, um, and doesn't right. really rule. He has a seneschal at the t- Tower of Grief that just manages everything, and then they ended up having to create an imperial bureaucracy to run the kingdom in absentia, essentially. It's almost a pseudo religious piece with the 17 families in the Lich King. So nice. <laughs> Very sweet. You Very know, sweet. Wow. Religious, yeah. man. All right. I got to step my game up now that I know this. All right. Let's go. <laughs> I, 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 again, with the Associate Project, eight DMs, not button heads, but trying oh. to one, up, one, up, one up each other. One up each other. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's not really it either. It's no, like, you hear something that's I'm great not, that somebody else did, and you go, I want to do that. How do I do that? It's, it's not so much that. It's that I actually, I like, I like the differences. And I like, so I said, like, for example, we got, was a human, human? Is that how you say it again? Yep. All right, yeah. So, but like, so, I mean, so with their whole, you know, xenophobic, they're xenophobic down there mm-hmm. um, and slavery and such. And, you know, the fact that they're, you know, that I would definitely declare open season on them. It's, it's, I think it's really cool how the, the countries and these little secrets can influence what we do in our own. It's not so much trying to one up, it's trying to make make a really cool working story for the whole entire land. And that's, no, I'm one up in all you fuckers. <laughs> oh, that's what you think, So There's nothing better than a kingdom of pirates, okay? Well, it's not a kingdom, but there's I, nothing better than a country of pirates. Come a country on. of pirates ruled by a lich. <laughs> no, <laughs> one no, up. No, it'd have to be a country of pirates ruled by a ninja, so there oh, you go. Oh, nice. We need, wait, a ninja we need, lich. Wait, we need a ninja land. We need a nearby ninja uh, land. You've got one. Oh. It's in the southeast. <laughs> and they're pachyderms. No, they need no. They need to be closer. We need to have the ninja. Oh, they're close. Because- they're close. <laughs> I I do want I to point out that close. Ilias Dahl is an isolationist empire, uh, and so they have forts all along that coastline to guard against all you people. Ah, it's back right. to the war game, Frank. Nice. Uh, <laughs> I'll go ahead and take the reins here. I have a lot of the East Coast. Uh, for my preparation, uh, I went ahead and set year zero as uh, the Ruina Tempesta. Uh, a massive sea surge uh, knocked out, and you can't really see it very well here. That would work with a... That would work with a... Yeah, it, with it's a right meteor. here behind these guys. Uh, but the Tortle land was actually part of Uratu. Uh, the sea swell actually ripped that portion out and made it something akin to Australia. Wiped out a lot of the interior of the Huria, the empire of the Huria in here in the Treachery Narrows and flooded this region, which is the Baffos Strait. So there's only like two, 300 feet of water here, and then it's uh-huh. tunnels uh, where the Moleskian dwarves ended up going over to this section. Uh, nobody's really sure how the Ruina Tempia, Tempestia occurred. Uh, common thoughts are uh the empire that used to be or is now uratu which is now flooded was a highly magical society they made a lot of artifacts that can still be found to this day so underneath the treachery narrows waters are a lot of sunken cities a lot of villages things of that nature uh exploration for it is not quite feasible because there is a creature there known as the nestle (laughs) because why not? Uh, 
that floats around, whether it is a sea- right, <laughs> yeah, whether it is a seaborne dragon or a dinosaur. Is it made of chocolate? It is not made of chocolate, but you can take a bite out of it if you'd like. Uh, but the Tempestia struck the eastern lands, uh, pretty much made this part of Uratu salt marsh when it ripped off uh, the Tortal Kingdom of Rebros uh, and flooded the Baphos Strait. It also went as far down as uh, the ruins of Upslanta, uh, which was a highly prosperous area. Uh, for the eastern coast, this marked year zero. Uh, so if it transpired because of all the meteor activity in the west and just circumvented the globe, it's hard to say. Uh, no one, not the scholars of Uratu or the Kingdom of Linga, know for sure. Uh, some in Uratu blame <clears throat> the zealots up north. Uh, what the zealots believe, uh, we'll get to that in two weeks when John is on here. Uh, I'm not going to speak for him, and he might call it something entirely different. I but... sort of wish I was on with John right now. I really do. <laughs> I hope he at least sees me calling him out. Well, the nice thing is we keep switching around, so we'll probably be partnered up with everybody. Uh, but yeah, I, I went with Year Zero as a massive flood zone, uh, and, and I thought, okay, I, I was going to use the volcanic activity, uh, but I've kind of used that for something else. But yeah, if it was caused by some celestial intercourse uh with the meteors uh i'm fine with that all i know is a giant flood really screwed with everybody's property because this area the treachery narrows uh is a valley essentially they flooded the tennessee valley uh and covered all of uh the pieces of the manhattan project so there is a shitload of magic but getting there is gonna be tough i mean you can you can get a boat <laughs> but a lot of people don't come back uh and the baffos strait uh it has just ruined villages because this area was the bread basket uh uh-huh. and now it is just salt water so i will entertain questions what um what was the 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 kingdom the empire what what was the power that was there before in 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 pce this it was Huria, the Huria? empire of Huria. It was pretty much, uh, we'll say, uh, uh, who'd the Greeks fight? Um, Persia, Persian, Persian. It, it was a Persian for scope. It was a Persian mm-hmm. empire. Uh, so a bunch of different peoples all kind of paying homage to a single greater king. Yes, and uh, very magic based. Uh, they had a military. Uh, but the magic is what kept the equine, uh, Aquinas people up here at bay. Uh, Ugros was always hill dwarves. It used to be called the Emerald Coast. Uh, when it got flooded, something else happened on the timeline, and I, I can get to that later. But yes, the Hurian people, uh, still the emperor of Kaplan is Hurian descent as our these tribes uh but this guy the emperor as he calls himself is of (laughs) hurian descent uh and he is the major landholder in this little reverse l-shaped nation uh and he's a dick shocking one of my npcs would be a dick you know just a general question to everybody what if the meteor was actually like a comet that broke up so you could have a piece that goes in the west and a big, huge piece that goes in the east. One that, I, I mean, because I originally was going to have mine be a volcanic eruption, <laughs> you know, but maybe I'll rethink that. I mean, it's it still work. It still could be a volcanic eruption in response to that. Well, I'll talk about mine it in a moment. Could, but it almost would make more sense if something plonked right in the, the, the ocean because... Yes, yeah. this, this is not that far south, I don't think, right? It's not no. that far south of me. My so area, I, no, your your area is right here. Yeah, it's just above it. So yeah. I mean, it would totally make sense if something came out, you know, towards the east. If it just, you know, and it, these were, and, and basically you said you're right. It's like a valley. Well, what if 
Holly Shelf in that area was a valley as well. And it's just, that's where the water went, mm -hmm. you know, and like Humini and Tar and Aquinas were all, you know, raised up enough that they were all spared. That would make sense. Mm -hmm. Well, and you have Osmano, which has the Carpathian Mountains, uh, and <clears throat> use it yeah. as a shield. Yeah. So. And that my, would make sense. my, my thought might be maybe the, that empire, that kind of Persian empire, they were trying to do something with their magic to sway the stars and sway this comet. Oh, they like swayed a comet into pieces. And they and... just fucked up. There, there, there is a legend, uh, the legend of the Torque, T-O-R-Q-U-E. -E. Uh, so you are not far off. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and it would be. It would obviously now be lost, right? No one would know what it was, and that could be something that, like, they didn't know what they were actually messing with. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that that's what up. the emperor wants to find. Ah, uh, that yeah, and that could be a good. That could be a good connection part. Okay, here is the tough part, boys and girls. We have 15 minutes late. Each oh, one God. of you gets five minutes, five glorious minutes. So Carol, kick us off with your elves. Okay, so Triskelion. So, well, that was, I, I guess I sort of touched on one of the things, so obviously the cataclysm, which now, I was going to be 5,000 years ago, and and uh, basically, but now, no, I'm going to go with the whole uh it, we have multiple comment. cataclysms. Yeah, well, no, oh, no, that's gonna. okay. Yeah, but you know what? That's okay. I actually really like this better um, to tie it all in. So year zero, basically, you had a comet that broke up, whatever, but it, and the, it drove the water in. Uh, and basically, that nation, the kingdom of Treskillian, kind of surrounded uh, the other, at the time, what I call it was? Kernis Krell. Uh, it sort of surrounded it. And... <clears throat> Sorry, and basically, yeah, it, it basically all of a sudden there is flooded, and it it, it it did kill a lot of people. Um, there were elves were much more numerous before that, and it said because they're elves and they don't reproduce at a great rate, they've never really recovered. Uh, that was going to be one, but the other, the other one I wanted to touch on was the uh, face step portal. Uh, about seventy five years ago, so figure. The math out there. Uh, a mysterious, like okay. basically, a magical portal was created from an arch fay. They don't know who, but it had to be someone at that level to create this level portal. They created it from the fay wild side and opened it into the into my kingdom. Well, uh, for a while there, the land was uninhabitable because the magics were on this side were uncontained and they would go nuts and things would come from the portal, some good, some bad. Um, it's the Feywild, you know, chaos kind of reigns. So it took them a while, but it took the, the, some of the mightiest and oldest uh, um, magic practitioners of elven magic, ancient elven magic to build a gate, which is still there. They haven't, you know, they, they, they don't want to shut it down um what are you doing <laughs> you you putting the it's maybe not that big a zone but uh you couldn't live in the nearby vicinity i mean nobody got killed from it i mean it took a bit for the magics to really ramp up to you know start scorching the land and people could get out of the way but they built but they basically built a gate and they do can the magics contain now uh, they, but it's sort of like the Stargate. Well, it's I'm trying to think of it as like by the yeah. I guess I'm trying. I haven't quite figured out how that's going to work. I'm going to assume. I'm going to say it's not like a Stargate. Actually, you can go either which way. Um, <clears throat> you know, if something's in it, you, you can still pass through the other direction. Uh, but you're not going to know who's coming through until they're through. Uh, so I said they they do have uh, they have a sentry posted there uh, to protect against enemies and I think actually that would be a little good campaign or scenario bit of maybe something comes through there that the adventurers have to go deal with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Elf killing. <laughs> 
Is it a time portal or an otherworldly portal? Otherworldly, because it goes to it goes to the Feywild. Okay. Yeah, it's not time. Okay. That'd be cool, time and no, no, just just to the Feywild. If you have the right magical amulet, it can be time. Well, of course, but then again, do you need a portal for, to use that amulet? Unless you, I, I don't know. This is your world. Mention. You you hate my Nazi ideas, so screw it. I'm not gonna. Well, I it. I didn't hate. I I I can't. Hey, I kept them. They're they're there. They're just not the ones in charge anymore. Fair enough, Spencer. Mm-hmm. You're yeah. up. Kaizen, Kaizen, the uh, hobgoblin uh, junta, hobgoblin junta. Yeah, this there is we the are. place that I'm not gonna like. No, 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 no. The hobgoblin, the, the goblinoids are are fair and respectable people. Um, okay. In fact, this is the story of their uprising. Um, so, yeah. uh, 300 years ago, the hobgoblins and goblins and bugbears of Paizan were enslaved by the chainers, the people that they call the chainers, um, who are, in fact, that island off to there that is now the scorned isle. Um, though that is not what they call it. Um, oh, what just happened? Something, something weird happened. I don't know. All right. So um, the Scorned Isle was once a great and powerful empire that the, controlled the entirety of Kaizen, the corresponding Western coastline. Um, and around 300 years ago, um, the, hoblob, the goblins, the hobgoblins, the bugbears, all the goblinoids were working tirelessly in bondage. Their life was short, cruel, and full of suffering. Uh, those who did not die underground working in mines or slaving away on the mountainsides were thrown into fighting pits for the amusement of the chainers. Then a creature started whispering to the shamans of the goblinoids, telling them it was time to fight back. These shamans thought that this thing that whispering to them was their ancestors, and they started to preach rebellion. Then merciless persecution followed from the chainers, which only spurned that rebellion onwards until a lone hobgoblin stood above raising their people. This was Kai's. Kai's the great pit fighter. He rose up and brought this great rebellion about, which culminated in a massive volcano exploding on what is now the scorned isle, blowing the island to pieces, blowing up the land bridge that connected it. A giant fissure ran through the ground creating wyvern pass separating and moving the plates until the kaizen mountain erupted for the first time 300 years ago now today the hobgoblin junta are the ones in charge there we go are the ones in charge of kaizen um six general sorry a council of five generals uh, controls the military side of the government, followed by a singular council of basically a, a, a shamanistic hierarchy. In reality, um, the people that were once this great empire that the hobgoblins called the Chainers, um, they were using the power of an eldritch being that was the thing that was whispering to the goblinoids. They then made a deal with them in, it instead, and it switched sides traveling under the ground, creating Wyvern Pass, and then finding its way into Mount Kaizen, where it erupted, where it lives to this day, where they have to make sacrifices to it in some way, continuously, forever, to keep it appeased. Now, where is Mount Kaizen? Oh, sorry, Kairos. I apologize. I I, I messed up the name there. My bad. Oh, okay. (laughs) Kairos, yeah. yeah, yeah. This one? Yep, that's it. That's it, yep. Yep. And that's where they have to do their uh, muddy grubbing. They got to do something. Yeah, they got to. They got to. They got to make some sort of way to appease this being that lives inside the mountain. Most, the, the that's, that however is only known by a select few. So, and this one, the uh, scorned isle, it only had a land bridge. It was not connected to the main continent. If it was connected any more than that, it isn't anymore. Okay. It was almost completely blown up in a massive eruption. And that's Ian. Ian's dealing with those people now, and then I'm dealing with the uh, with Kaizen, the hobgoblins, after the fact. Nice. Yes, these are friendly hobgoblins, Carol. Yeah, they do a lot of trade. Yeah, okay. They built a bridge. They built a bridge so they could trade with people. They're currently working on a canal. 
Yeah. They're cool. Oh. Jeff, Jeff, John, and I have the asshole populace. Yeah, okay, okay. And I got a lot of them. <laughs> Why is that not shocking in the least? Because I got you twelve. I, I I got the short end of the stick. I got twelve nations. So well, I, I mean, figuratively you built a speaking, huge I, I have a lot of nice people. There are a few assholes. Uh, Jason, uh, let's discuss the forty third dynasty of your Lich King. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I I had one other uh, country I did, but in the interest of time, I'll just pick an event in the in the Iliastal region. Uh, so on 361 of the common year, uh, a bard showed up at a, what the village is no longer even on the map, but a small village known as Maritza. Uh, he began telling jokes and pretty soon the members of the village began laughing at the jokes and what would later become known as the laughing plague quickly spread to everyone within the village. Uh, all, all the residents began laughing and as the bard left town, the villagers followed, laughing behind him, man, woman, and child. He walked towards a nearby wood, uh, old growth wood in the middle of the uh, country, um, walked around the woods 19 times with all the villagers laughing. Hard, and as the villagers continued to laugh for 19 days, they laughed, began falling dead as they walked around. He took the remaining into the woods. <coughs> They were never seen again. And now periodically the specter of all those villagers will come out, do a procession around the woods of spirits, and then go back in. And folks that see them run risk of joining their procession. So that was in the year, common year 361. That was a one-off quick event, the, uh, the laughing play, the laughing plague. Uh, and the woods are now known, the woods are now known as Krom Maritza, the, the dead wood. Love it. Is it the bard of snipe? <laughs> Go on a snipe hunt. So where on the map, where is this located at? Is it the uh, I well I can let me tell you. Because I, I put everything I gave a, a point to. Uh Karam Maritza is on twenty four point two two to and twenty three the 23, 24.22 and 23 on your original map that's labeled. So I think it's in the in that big wood line right to the west. Yeah, the big woods right to the re, uh, west of Ravenia. This one? Yep, that one. Okay. Uh, okay. The old growth woods. So do I need to replace that with the dead woods? Uh, no. Okay. I'm, I think I've got lots of little points of interest all over on mine. But on your big map, it becomes kind of hard to yeah, do it's, anything to flutter the map. So we're, we're just, folks at home, we're just trying to do the major areas. That's why every one of these rivers is huge. They're like the Mississippi and the Missouri. Uh, and that is why they are there. So there, there's a lot of features that each one of us have created uh, that are best served on a child map uh, of the nation. Uh, but we're doing the best we can, and as you can tell, we're having fun with it. Uh, oh boy, again, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I cannot express how much this project is really stirring the creative juices. I mean, even on this show, you yep. know, let's discuss the meteors, let's discuss the celestial things, and it ju everything just coalesces. So you can do the same thing with your players, young DMs, and I highly suggest that you do uh, because... Yes, you're the God, you're the creator, blah, blah, blah. Shoulder the load. That's why these guys have volunteered their time and effort. They're going to go ahead and uh, give you several pages, if not reams of information that you may never use. But you know what? Everything makes for really good lore. Um, and you can always take it and put it somewhere else. Yep. Or change the name or whatever. I mean, it, you know, this is this is going to be an open source kind of thing. Uh, well, not truly open source because I don't want your input because you're all stupid. I'm just kidding. Hey. <laughs> uh, no, the the eight the seven other DMs are really putting forth a lot of effort into these projects, and you'll be able to see that once we get it. Uh, put together in December, uh, and in December we're just going to open it up and we're going to run adventures in these areas. So look for that uh, coming in 
seven months, eight months, nine right. months something like that. Uh, folks, this has been the Socium Project. Uh, thank you for joining us. In two weeks, you get the other four DMs with their input on their nations and their timeline. Uh, we will get this all fleshed out. And again, the source book will be an awesome item for everybody. Um, am I forgetting anything? Follow us on Twitch, follow us on Twitter, take a look at our YouTube archive. If you want to shoot the shit about D&D, join our Discord. If you want to buy our crap, or I'm sorry, good stuff, it's the link is down below. If you want custom dice, go on over to Twitter at Pirate Dog Dice. If you want your game to smell a whole lot better, whoop, I need to work on my camera angles, and I need to work on the updated map. Uh, go on over to oddfishgames.com, check out their Adventure Sense, also their Shine system. Folks, for all of us here in the Socium Project, if you have any questions or comments, uh, hit us up on Twitter or email, or Gmail, uh, mhoboinc, and I'll get it to the right nation group. So uh, let's all wave goodbye and uh, blow them a big kiss. Mwah. Bye, everybody.